All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so today we're gonna we're just gonna do a little bit more of the semester. We're almost almost to the end, um, but I want to talk today and potentially a little bit Monday morning about virtualization because it's kind of like this is maybe like the trap door at the end of the class that that leads some of you in, in kind of a new direction because this is cool. So and and to some degree, I mean, this is a little bit more modern than some of the classical operating systems material that we've been talking about so far. So we'll see how far we get today and then probably wrap up this on Monday morning before we do some exam review. All right. And as a reminder, so on Monday we will meet at 8 a.m. Um, we will finish uh, virtualization or, or the material I want to get through, and then we'll do some exam review. Right. So there's a practice exam that's been posted. It's not a practice. It's the exam from last year. Um, and that's what we'll go through on Monday together. So if you have some time beforehand, take a look at that. Both the exam and the solutions are online. And that'll give you a, a sense of how this year's exam will look. Um, and the exam will cover everything we get through through Monday. Last year, I didn't tape the exam review. This year, because I'm going to do some material, I'll tape it. So that'll be online as well. So um, just in case, just in case you don't get here at 8 AM. But it's good practice, because if you don't get here at 8 AM a week from Monday, you'll be sad. Um, all right. So. The, uh, the response rate on the course feedback forum jumped quite dramatically uh, overnight, but it's still not over 70%. So you guys are still, it's about 50% right now. So if you keep going at that rate, then it'll be like 200% in a couple days. Um, but yeah, so, so the incentives are outlined on the website. 70% gets you a medium answer question. What did I say? 70% gets you a short answer question, sorry. <laughs> Don't refer to me, refer to the website because the website is correct. So 70 is short answer, 80 is medium answer, and nine, the 90 percent, the gold standard, would be, would be a long answer question. Right. And uh, yeah, Paul. Yep. These are cumulative, right? So you could potentially expose yourself to a great, a great deal of the exam beforehand, right? Um, okay. So. Any questions? So last time we finished talking about sort of the last step of, of performance improvement, which was sort of actually what to do. So any questions about this before we just do a little bit of review? I just want to cover the high points. I know we talked about performance for a while. Uh, may have started all to blend together. So the first thing we had to do was measure our system, right? That was the first step in the process of doing performance analysis. What, what, other, what other choices did we have to make at this point? We're, we're starting the process of performance improvement. And you know, we're, we want to take some measurements. We want to use those measurements to decide what to do. What were some of the challenges or some of the decisions we had to make at this stage? Mukta. Do you remember any of the things we talked about when we started talking about measurement? Kobina, you want to help us? Yeah, so we, we decide kind of like what what are we going to actually measure, right? Are we going to try to measure the real system, or are we going to try to uh, uh, produce an analytical model for the system that we can use to make predictions, or, or are we going to build a simulator, right? Um, and then we needed to figure out what the system was going to be doing while we measured it, right? So decide uh, you know, what benchmarks we're going to run, and then also what instrumentation are we going to use to actually take the, take the measurements, right? What was the next step, Wembley? After we take measurements, what do we do? Next. Yeah, so I'm going to actually analyze the results, right? And, and what were some of the challenges here, Paul? Yeah, so this is where we, we ended up, you know, maybe being challenged by our, our, our relationship with statistics or lack thereof, right? Um, and, you know, we needed to, to make sure that we use the appropriate statistic techniques. Um, and, and, and be careful of summarizing the data too soon, and also really try to understand the outliers in your data. Right? Don't try to make them go away. You know, uh, make sure you understand what, what they are. And then Robert, what was the next step? Yeah, so actually we're going to do something now, right? So we're going to improve the slow parts of the system. Or really what we're going to try to do is improve the overall system, right? So we talked about sometimes how improving the slowest parts may not even really be the right thing to do, right? And what, what were some of the other, other challenges here? Dan. Yeah, 
Yeah, so you know, there's a, you know, a couple of things all mixed in there, right? So I may not be able to improve the performance of a particular part of the system, or it may be very difficult, right? And the longer I work on a part of the system, the less likely it is to be, uh, to be, uh, to be the problem, right? So that was, that was kind of our, our last serving of Amdahl's law, right? So who can, who can give me the least colloquial version of Amdahl's law that we presented, Sam? No, the most computer science. Oh, okay. The least colloquial. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you, uh, you know, the system, yeah, so that's that's kind of my Amdahl's law corollary. That's that's uh, that's what Dan got at. Um, someone else want to chat? It includes the word. I'm trying to think what it, what word <laughs> what, what it actually is. Bounded. Maybe anyone want to try? To answer? Sarah, want to try and answer with bounded in? Um, Come on, look at that energy drink sitting right there. That's the Kickstarter. Is not. Well, I mean, the are also there. So yeah, I know, I know. You can cheat, right? Right. The the com impact of any constraint. Sorry, I didn't include the word bounded. So I was I I fed you a red herring. Um, the impact of any effort to improve system performance is constrained by the performance of the parts of the system not targeted by the improvement. Right? You can only make a system faster to the degree that the parts that you're not working on are still there and still going to be part of the problem. Right? Um, you know, and, and this was kind of like the how to explain it to your statistically challenged boss. Right? You know, I'm going to work on the part of the system that's hurting us. Right? I'm going to find the part of the system that's hurting us, and that's what I'm going to improve. And then as, um, as both Daniel and Sam pointed out, the more you improve part, one part of your system, the more time you invest in a certain aspect of system performance, the less likely it is that that performance is your problem. Right? So this, this argues for sort of a continual reevaluation. You know, don't get stuck down there in the last part. I mean, that's the fun part, right? I mean, to some degree, to computer scientists, like the fun part is the hacking part. So you know, there's this tendency to think, oh, wow, I found the problem, and then you work on it for six months. Right? But in the meantime, you know, A, maybe things have changed, and B, now you've got other problems to work on, right? All right, any questions about this before we talk about virtualization? All right, so, so virtualization is, is you know, to, to some degree, uh, you know, some, some of my, my, my thematic thinking about this class, at least last year, had, you know, the matrix in mind, right? Some of the old assignments on the old website had, like, little matrix quotes on them, right? Because I think there's something matrix-esque about, um, about operating systems, right? I mean, this is like, as an application programmer, you've been exposed to these illusions, right? You know, and this is not the way the real world is. And so you, know, you go through this process, you take the red pill, you, know, you pop out down in the operating system, and you realize that you know, memory is not contiguous, and there isn't an infinite amount of it, and you know, the machine isn't actually doing 16 things at once. And so that's kind of fun, right? Um, virtualization, I mean, if you want to continue to extend that metaphor, virtualization is like, I mean, how many people have seen the Matrix movies? Oh, thank God. <laughs> OK, good. Because they're good, and also because <laughs> prove that we, we have something in common, <laughs> you, you and I. Um, so you know, the, the virtualization is like the point in that movie, I don't know, it's like in the third movie when, when the, the, the architect explains to, to Neo that this is like the, what, the third or fourth time that Zion has been destroyed, right? And suddenly he realizes that there's this whole other lack of reality to, to his own world, right? There's this whole other thing that, that he hasn't even understood. He thought he knew the truth, right? But now there's someone who's presented him with the bigger truth of which he's only a part, right? So up until this point, we've been talking about operating systems that run on, on real physical machines, right? And the thing is that this is less and less common, right? I mean, it's, it's still common to some degree. I mean, most people here are still running an operating system that runs on a real, a real physical machine, right? But increasingly, what we've seen, especially with the move to sort of cloud computing and you know, commuting as a service and commodity computing, is this idea that we, what we do is, you know, if you, how many people have used EC2? Right? How many people have done assignments for this class? Right? So you guys have, I hope, I hope everyone's hand goes up. You guys, you guys have used virtualization technologies, right? 
And we'll talk a little bit about today about some of the problems with the operating system that the virtualization is, is intended to get around. But a lot of the computing resources you use, you use today are increasingly not run on bare metal, right? They are, they are run inside what's called a virtual machine mo monitor, right? And they're run inside of what's called a virtual machine. And a virtual machine is, is really kind of exactly uh, what we think about. Actually, this is just some terminology, so let's get through this. Um, when we... When, when we start talking about virtual machines, we start having to distinguish between uh, different operating systems because there's an operating system that is potentially operating the physical machine, and then there's an operating system that is running inside the virtual machine. So we usually call the operating system that runs inside the virtual machine the guest OS, right? Uh, what, do, what do we call the operating system that runs the physical machine? Yeah, Jen. The host OS, right? So if you guys have been Googling around on virtual box forums when you've run into problems, you may see answers where people identify, like, I'm running you know, uh, an Ubuntu guest on a Windows 7 host, right? Or I'm running a Windows 7 guest on an Ubuntu host, or whatever, right? So, that's, so we start to have to distinguish between the operating system that's running on this virtual hardware and the operating system that's actually managing the physical hardware, right? Um, and, and really, you know, virtual machines is, is, a, is a term that we've, we've, um, we've heard a lot, but we, I don't, I, you know, when I started thinking about this, it really struck me as, it's, it's very apt, right? So what we're really trying to do here is trying to virtualize hardware, right? Um, and virtual machines are, are designed to differ from physical machines in, in some important ways in order to allow an operating system. So the goal here is really to allow the guest OS to think, right? that it is running on real hardware, right? On, on a sort of classically virtualized system, what we want is for the guest operating system to not know that, unbeknownst to it, there is this other operating system or many other operating systems that are sharing the same physical machine. Why is this hard? Why, you know, all the, you have to go back to the very beginning of the semester. I mean, why, why is this difficult to do with operating systems? On or on? Well, that's how we do it, right? But what about operating systems? You know, what about the classical design of operating systems makes this difficult? Um, yeah, we're getting closer to the right answer. I mean, it, you know, this, this is not a trick question, right? It just. I mean, the answer is really operating systems aren't, were never designed to do this, right? Operating systems were designed to manage physical machines, right? It's like, you gave me a machine, this is my machine to manage, right? Now suddenly we're telling it, no, 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 you've got to share with this other machine, there's this other machine, and, and now actually, I'm, you know, I need to put somebody else in charge of you, right? So operating systems, you know, at least in, in the dawn of operating systems, were designed to manage collections of physical hardware, and they, they're not used to sharing, right, these, these hardware resources. They're used to being the people who manage the sharing, right? That's the job of the operating system, is to you know, uh, divide the physical resources between, between the applications that are running on top of it. Right? But it's used to having this exclusive access, and yes, to using the privileged features of the machine in order to multiplex resources. Right? That was why, you know, remember back you know, three months ago, why, do we give operating, why did you give the operating system this privilege? It's because you want it to make these decisions about resource allocation. Right? That's why you granted it this privilege, and now we have to, to start watering that privilege down and make the operating system play nice with, with other things. Right? So the, the, the goal of a virtual machine is we don't want to give the guest OS exclusive access to the underlying physical machine. Right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why this is. And, and the way that we do that, as somebody hinted, right, is that we have to deprivilege in some way the operating system. Because if I take an operating system that's designed to control a set of physical resources and I try to run it alongside other operating systems, in the worst case, if I give it full privilege, it still has access to the whole machine, right? And so it can affect other virtual machines or the host OS, right? Which is what we don't want to happen, right? We can, we think, we, we, people sometimes talk about this as, you know, a way that the, the guest OS could pierce the virtual machine, right? And, and kind of get out and, and do things I don't want it to do, right? So what we do here is, is we create a separate piece of software. So what we're going to design, and this is essentially what companies like VirtualBox right, and VMware are selling. Right? They're selling 
virtual machine monitors, right? A virtual machine monitor is a piece of software that's designed to create a virtualized hardware environment, right? And the, really the goal, the ultimate goal of these is to be able to run an unmodified or potentially lightly modified operating system inside of it, right? And to be able to present that operating system with the illusion of running inside a virtual machine that's a, that, that has access to a subset of the physical resources that are present on the machine. And if you do this well, you know, it's, it's really pretty amazing how well it can work. Right? Like I frequently have you know, two or three different virtual machines running at the same time upstairs on my machine because I like to use them to kind of keep things organized. Right? Um, and the, again, the ultimate goal is to allow the guest OS to be run as an application. Right? We're talking about, and this, is, this, is really, this lecture is really more focused on consumer virtualization, so the type, type of stuff you guys have been doing this semester. Right? You have an application that you installed called VirtualBox that allows you to run another operating system, in this case Ubuntu or Linux, inside on your machine, and you can essentially run that anywhere, right? And this, this is kind of funny, right? Because we said at one point, you know, the operating system was just another program, right? That's, you know, this, this is kind of like the fullest extension of that, right? The operating system is a program. The program requires certain privileges to run, but if I'm careful about how I manage those privileges, I can actually get that program to run alongside other instances of itself or other programs running on the same machine. Right, so this is kind of fun. So we'll come back to how you know later today and maybe on Monday morning, right? But let's talk about um, operating system problems with operating systems. Guru. Yeah. Okay. So th there is yes and no, right? So one of the things that's happened, right? So so Guru is asking about how many people remember x86 privilege rings. Not really going to talk about x86 privilege rings, but um, one of the things that's happened over time is that as hardware virtualization started to catch on, it become, became a popular uh, way to, for, for a variety of reasons which we're about to discuss, right? It's sort of weaknesses with, with traditional operating systems and the isolation that operating systems provide and some other issues. So we're going to get to this in terms of why we want to virtualize. But once people started to create virtual machines and become interested in virtualization, hardware makers started to improve their architectures in ways that facilitated this. So I think that x86 privilege rings were originally designed in a way that, that helped make this possible. But the problem is that if a, you take an operating system that's used to running in, in the lowest ring and try to run it with less privilege, it doesn't work. Right? And so there are some changes you have to make regardless. Right? So, that, so that's, a, that's a technique that we'll come back to as well. So you know, there, there, there are two potential goals, right? One is that I could take an operating system and I want to run it completely unmodified, right? And that's what people sometimes call full hardware virtualization, right? I don't want the operating system to know it all. And then another approach was, uh, that started to happen also is that operating systems started to realize that this was a popular thing to do, and they started to you know, modify their behavior in order to facilitate virtualization, right? So I can get a, a, a version of Linux that's been designed to run in a virtualized environment, right? And we'll, we'll come back to this, but that's a very good question, right? So there have been both hardware changes and operating system changes that have occurred to facilitate virtualization over, particularly over the last couple of decades, right? Since it started to become more popular. All right, so so again, I, I you know I hope by this point you know we've we've we we can agree that operating systems are pretty cool and that they you know they they do a really nice job of providing some of these nice abstractions as well as managing the resources on the system, right? But let's talk about some problems with operating system designs, right? So what's what's one potential problem with with operating systems that that you know so so the, the, it's kind of this question of like why would we actually want to virtualize in the first place, right? You know, I've got operating systems, they work well on real machines. What are the, some of the things that, that might have driven us to this, to this length, right? Could, let's try to, you know, a after three months of loving them, let's try to be, be critical of our, of our operating system friends. Yeah, Amit. OK, yeah, so, so you, have these, you can potentially have these couplings between operating systems and applications, right? So not only do some applications, are some applications not good at running an operating, other operating systems, what else is potentially true? Do, does every application you've ever used run on every operating system ever created? No, 
right? Uh, you know, maybe maybe you're trying to run some old game that stopped working after you know Windows fixed problems with their memory management system, right? Or maybe you're trying to you know run a software toolkit that only runs on Mac, right? Or runs something that runs on only on Linux, right? So yeah, there are these kind of separate pools of software that developed because um, because people targeted certain platforms, right? And if you're someone like me who you know avoids you know installing Microsoft applications like the plague but sometimes people send you a word document that you for some reason have to use then you have a virtual machine sitting there that runs Windows 7 and has word installed and you fire it up for five minutes uh, or when you come across that increasingly rare website that only works on Internet Explorer right there's like five or six of them left out there right but they still do exist I found a few um, okay so that's one problem what else what are other problems with operating system Sarah Yeah, so, so, so people, yeah, so, so geeky people, like I think including Sarah herself, have done this thing where they like will take their computer and allow it to like boot several different operating systems, right? So this is kind of like, I don't know, it's like a, a committee approach to, <laughs> to managing resources. Like, okay, I'm running Windows for all, I got tired of Windows, I'm, I'm going to depose Windows and I'm going to put Ubuntu in charge for a while. But what's, what's annoying about that? What do you have to do in order to do that? You have to restart the system and that's kind of a pain. Right. And then also you lose all the state that you had and, and whatever. So yeah, so I might want to run multiple operating systems on the machine, same machine at the same time, right? And, 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 you know, not, I think, well, that's still probably a pretty geeky thing to do, though, right? So it's not like a common use case. Varun, what about other, other problems with operating systems? I want to throw something. Shikar, I keep calling you Varun, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. You do that. Windows actually does have a command line. It's just terrible to use. Yeah. <laughs> Dan. Yeah. So, so this is one of the things. So, um, one of the groups of problems that, that we can talk about is this idea of sort of what, what's called hardware coupling, right? So, you know, once I load a particular operating system, I've kind of coupled whatever resources are on that machine to being managed by that operating system, right? So, this this provides a couple of problems. First of all, I can't. You know, as, as Sarah wants to do, I can't run multiple versions of Windows on the same machine at the same time, right? Um, but that's, again, that's a little geeky. Um, you know, it's, uh, it can also be very difficult to transfer software setups from machine to machine, right? So if I've gotten a particular, let's say I've got a, a web server and I've got it up and running and I've got it running on this machine and then someone says, actually, you know, we need to move that to a new machine or we need to upgrade the, the operating system and suddenly all my all my components break, right? Um, and then it can also be very, you know, messy or annoying to adjust hardware resources to meet the system's needs, right? So, you know, let's. How do you how do you add RAM to a system? How do you actually do that? Has someone, how many people have done this before? Right? This is my, you know, if you take anything, well, hopefully you'll take other things away from the class. But if you ever have to help a family member with their computer, this is my number one suggestion. Right? It's just install more RAM. It always works. Right? It is the number one thing to do, and it'll get you at least two or three years of peace and quiet from that person before the machine starts, before all the malware that they've installed starts to take over that new RAM that you've installed. Right? Um, but, how, but how do you do it? Like, what's the process of installing RAM on one of your machines? Andrew, like, how would you, let's say you got a laptop, looks like, looks like a nice laptop, starts to get a little slow. How do you put new RAM in there? Yeah. Yeah, so requires sticking your hand in the box and mucking around, right? Like I gotta like, you know, shut the machine down. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you probably should shut the machine down. <laughs> People will probably try this with the machine running. It'd be kind of interesting to see what would happen. Uh, but anyway, I mean, it requires stopping the machine, putting in new RAM, and, and then what I've done is I've, I've got a machine that has RAM, but that machine, that, that, that machine now has the RAM that I just bought, right? So if later I decide, well, I want this other, this other machine's running slow and it needs more RAM and I stopped working on this one machine, it's very difficult. So, so essentially what I'm doing is I'm coupling between the operating system and whatever the operating system is doing and the hardware resources that I've allocated to it, right? I mean, nice, it might be nice to, to, to be able to be more flexible, 
right? To be able to say, okay, well, this machine's running slow. I'm going to give it some more RAM, right? Or, you know, this this machine is heavily loaded right now, and so I'm going to devote more of the physical resources to it, right? And yeah, so this requires this sort of static upfront provision of machine resources, right? Which which can be very difficult, especially given the fact that you know, particularly on server setups, a lot of servers see very very you know, very, very uh, sporadic and, and, and variable load, right? Um, so isolating applications from each other is, is also a problem, right? And you think to some degree that operating, and so operating systems provide a form of isolation, right? In, in general, operating systems provide kind of some contract applications that says, here's, here's the things that other applications shouldn't be able to do to you, right? It's kind of this like non-molestation agreement, right? But operating systems also still leak a lot of information between applications, which might be a security uh, problem if you're, if you're really worried about, about your data, right? So for example, if, if you're running some sort of very sensitive application and you go to some cloud hosting provider and they say, oh yeah, sure, I'll run your application on the same physical machine with a bunch of other stuff, right? Including stuff written by your competitor and maybe you know applications written by unknown bad guys or whatever, you may not be super happy about that, right? Because operating systems do sometimes leak information and there are various, you know, if you look in the security community, there are all sorts of interesting sort of side channel attacks and different ways that you can, you can use some visibility you have in the operating system to gain information about what other applications on the same machine are doing, right? Um, also, I mean, th this has gotten a little bit better maybe, right? But, but if, you, if you grew up when I did, you remember these incredible headaches that you would go through trying to get like two useful applications to install at the same time on Linux, right? It was like almost impossible, right? You'd spend like a day getting cool thing A to work, and then you'd start trying to get cool thing B to work, and cool thing B would require you to install half the things you installed for cool thing A, which then wouldn't work anymore, or require a new version of this library, which conflicted with the old one. So, so this, can be, this can be kind of ugly, right? And, and, and this, this is another way that that applications are not isolated from each other, right? Because applications require usually some configuration of the machine, some set of libraries, some set of tools to work, right? Um, and as we talked about before, you know, in certain cases, the, the environment that's required by a particular application may be so specific that the vendors aren't even willing to support it if you put it on a machine and try to run it next to anything else, right? So again, I mean, do not try to run your, you know, uh, internet server, your web server, and your database server on the same machine, because you will not get support from either of the companies that you spent thousands of dollars to, to uh, buy these applications for. So, so back before virtualization, what did this mean? Right? Let's say I'm a, I'm a company and I've got you know, a little web application I want to run. I need a file server, I need a web server, and I need a database server to run my application. What do I have to do? Robert. Buy three machines. Yep. Buy three machines, install potentially three different versions of an operating system that's the exact version that that system likes, and then hire three separate people who are experts at those operating systems to maintain, right? And then what, what's the problem with that? I mean, that doesn't sound that bad, right? We've created some jobs, right? What's, 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 what, what becomes a problem other than the fact that you have three system administrators, right, who have to get along, and that's very difficult because you know how system administrators are. Um, what's the... Uh, what, what's the what's the other problem with that? What's what, what's being wasted here potentially? Tao. Uh, what's that? Uh, I, I still can't hear you. Yeah, I mean, it could be expensive to buy three machines, but but what what do what do what do I what am I willing to bet about at least one of those three machines, Sam? You're not maximizing the power of Yeah, I'm I'm going to bet you that one of those three machines is going to be underutilized most of the time, right? Whatever part of the system that's not the bottleneck is going to be underutilized, and the other two machines are going to be sitting there, and there's nothing I can do about it, right? Like I've got two machines that are the bottleneck; they're they're completely you know, redlined, and one machine is just sitting there, you know, one system administrator is like, you know, taking three hour lunches and the other two are working overtime. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is kind of an issue. So these are, these are some of the realize, uh, reasons for this, right? And, and these are some of the, you know, along with trying to address some of those problems, there are also just these like nice, cool things that we can now do, right? So for example, I mean, how many people have ever 
other than for this class, ever sort of downloaded a whole prepackaged software environment to fool around with something online before, right? So this is now starting to become a little bit more common, and I think it's really cool, right? So you'll go, for example, and, and there's some company that's trying to sell you some new software tool, and rather than you know, having a web page that's this long with all the instructions that you need to follow in order to get their tool to install, they just say, hey, here's a VirtualBox appliance, right? You can download it, you run it at VirtualBox, it boots up, everything's installed, you can play around, when you're done, you can delete it. You didn't have to make a single change to your system, right, or any system that you care about to experiment with their software, so that's kind of neat, right? Um, we can also, again, we can do this, this provisioning, right? So we can take these big servers, right? And we can try to pack those servers with smaller machines in a way that, that maximizes the uh, usage of the server resources, right? So rather than having three servers, they're all lightly loaded, I can put all those machines onto one big machine and I can potentially divide the larger machine's resources at runtime between the smaller machines in a way that tries to maximize performance, right? So that's kind of cool. And, and also, again, I mean, I can take this entire machine, right, an entire server with all sorts of state, you know, applications that are installed, all the scripts that I need to run, and I can just put it somewhere else, right? I can package it up, I can take it offline, I can move it to another machine, right? So, so this, these things just are, you know, this kind of a system administrator's dream, right? Like, I need to take a machine offline, I migrate all the resources off it, I do some stuff with it, I move everything back, right? So, th so these gives us, th this stuff gives us some really, really nice powers. It's really, again, it's, it's almost like being able to take, you know, an entire machine, right? It's, it's like, you know, if, if Andrew wanted to reinstall his laptop, right? Or he needed to, you know, he had something that was running on his laptop, some sort of server that was, you know, I don't know, some, very important to him, right? He could take that and he could just squeeze it onto Jen's laptop, right? He could do whatever he needed to do and then he could take it and, and put it back, right? So this is, this is kind of a neat idea. So it's also interesting to know that virtualization is not, not a new idea, right? And, and they're actually, you know, if, if you're, if you're a, a sort of history of operating systems geek, they like to point out all these you know, places in the past where people had similar ideas and these early systems that were built to facilitate a lot of these same things. Um, and in 1974, there was, a, there was a paper that essentially identified the three requirements for a virtual machine monitor, right? So if I'm going to write a piece of software that's going to create a virtual machine, it has to be able to do three things, right? The first thing is that the software that runs inside my virtual machine should execute identically to the way it would on real hardware. Modulo timing, right? Like we would assume the timing's not gonna be the same, the virtual machine may be slower, probably slower, right? But modulo timing, the, so the operating system that runs inside my virtual machine should not be able to detect that it is running on virtualized hardware as opposed to running on physical hardware. There should be no difference in its execution, right? At the same time, I also, need, I also want to achieve good performance, right? And in order to do this, right, the, 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 big, tr the big trick that makes virtualization work is that, and the big thing that distinguishes virtualization from something like simulation, for example, is that on a virtualized machine, most instructions execute on physical hardware, right? They don't, they're not emulated, they're not simulated by the virtual machine monitor. I want to allow as many instructions as possible to use the hardware resources because that's what's fast. Right? So as much as possible, I want to allow instructions that are executed inside the virtual machine to run on the physical machine. Right? And there are some exceptions to this, which we'll talk about. Right? Um, and the, the virtual machine monitor should be in control of all the hardware resources that are provided to it. Right? So uh, whatever you know, hardware I've been given, you know, I should not allow the, the, uh, the code that's running inside the virtual machine to affect stuff outside of it. Right? So if I, you know, if I give a virtual machine on my system a gigabyte of RAM, it shouldn't suddenly be consuming two. Right? Like that's, the, that's the physical machine. Right? Like your physical machines don't get to suddenly make up new RAM. Right? And, and the virtual machine shouldn't either. Right? So as, as Guru and some other people pointed out earlier, there, there's two, two general sort of approaches to virtualization. Right? The full virtualization approach says, I want to be able to take an unmodified guest operating system, right? So I take a binary, right? I take a binary operating system that's been compiled for real hardware, 
and I can run it inside my virtual machine. Right? That, that is the idea behind full virtualization. Para-virtualization, on the other hand, so, so how many people have heard of Zen? Okay, so, so, so Zen, and there were some other you know, systems that were the, the first to propose this para-virtualization approach, which uh, says that, it, it kind of, their, their, their point was kind of like full virtualization is hard, right? And it could potentially cause some, some significant performance overheads. And so let's compromise just a little bit. Right? Let's just have some small changes that I'm going to make to the guest operating system. Right? So, now, so now the guest operating system is going to be compiled for a virtual environment. Right? But if I make some small changes to the guest operating system, I can potentially improve performance quite a bit. Right? So this is, and, and those small changes are made specifically to in, improve interaction with the virtual machine monitor and make virtualization easier. Right? So, let's, so we're going to talk about full virtualization, because right? it's kind of, Kind of uh, well, I don't know. They're both interesting, right? Um, so again, so the goal for the goal of full virtualization is to run the unmodified operating system in a virtual machine that you know essentially appears to be an application running next to other applications on the on the guest on the host operating system, right? So why is this difficult? Let's say you know I I, I take I've got my virtual machine monitor, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I simulate boot somehow, and now I've got my, my guest operating system that's running inside of it. Why, why is this so difficult? What's, what's, you know, what, what's the challenge here? What is the guest operating system going to try to do? Yeah, it's going to try to, it's going to try to manage the hardware resources on the machine, right? All of them, potentially. Right? It's going to say, hey, I'm in charge. I'm the operating system. Right? This is an interesting machine you have here. Right? You know, oh, OK, it's only got a gigabyte of memory. But oh, this is this TLB, for example. That's mine to manage. Right? Hey, I can put things in the TLB and take them out or whatever. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the guest OS is, is going to try to do this. And, um, and so there's a couple of, of bits of subtlety here. Right? So first of all, the guest OS is going to try to handle and manage virtual resources on the machine. Right? The next thing that's very interesting, right? So let's say I have a, let's say I have a application that's running inside my, my virtual machine, and let's say let's let's use MIPS as an example. Let's say that application makes a system call, right? So how does it do that? First of all, what's the instruction on MIPS that I use to initiate a system call? Syscall, right? So normally, what should happen? This is a good review. What should happen when the syscall instruction is executed? Spencer. Yeah, you guys remember what happens? You know, I, you know, th this is a software exception. I'm supposed to jump to a particular point of code and start executing instructions, right? You know, who installs those exception handlers? Yeah, that's part of the operating system code. Okay, so now. I've got a application running inside my virtual machine. Okay? So now that application, right? So the virtual machine is running. That application wants to do a system call. Who should handle that system call? Yeah. The guest operating system, right? But if I don't do anything clever, where is what's going to happen when I execute that system call? Where is the hardware? Go what is the hardware going to try to do? Remember, this is hard. This is hardwired into the hardware, right? What, what will the hardware try to do? There's someone new. Wembley. Traffic to the host OS. Yeah. So the hardware wants to go to the host OS, right? The hardware is hardwired. The host OS installed those exception handlers there, right? So the hard the hardware wants to go to the host OS, right? The thing I need to do is I need to get the guest OS to, to handle the trap, right? Now, OK, just, just to just blow your mind a little bit more, right? So what happens if the virtual machine monitor itself issues a system call? Who should handle that? What's that? I hear mixtures of two answers. <laughs> the host, right? So you know, because the, the, the virtual machine might, might cause a page fall. Sorry, the virtual machine monitor. 
virtual machine monitor might cause a page fault. The virtual machine monitor might have files that it uses to run. It's, a, it's an application running on the system. Right? So traps that are generated inside the guest OS need to be handled by, sorry, traps that are, man, this stuff even bends my brain a little bit. Traps that are, that are generated by applications running inside the virtual machine need to be handled by the guest operating system, right? not by the host operating system. The other thing that's hard is that the guest operating system is, is going to try to execute these privileged instructions. right? So when the guest operating system executes a privileged instruction, let's say the guest operating system tries to do something like um, modify the TLB. Right? Let's say, you know, again, this is, OK, fine. This is not x86, this is not x86 anymore. right? Why could it be a problem for the guest operating system to try to change, to change uh, virtual address mappings on the machine? What could that allow it to do? So first of all, do I need to allow the guest operating system to alter virtual memory mappings on the machine? Nick? Yeah, well, the answer is yes, right, sometimes, right, because it needs to do that to handle traps inside the guest operating system, right? If a page fault occurs that's generated by an application that's running inside the virtual machine, the guest operating system needs to adjust the, the, hardware, the, the underlying physical hardware accordingly, right? But what could, if I gave the guest operating system permission to modify the TLB in any way, what could that allow it to do? Tim? Right, if I can load translations in the TLB, I can load translations that point to anywhere in memory, right? So suddenly, hey, my virtual machine doesn't have a gigabyte of memory anymore. Now it's got four, right? Because I can see the whole machine and I can see things that are outside of, outside of that machine, right? Um, so this is essentially what happens if I try to run the guest OS and I just give it kernel privileges, right? Let's say I just say, okay, I'm gonna allow the guest OS to just run just like the host OS does, right? With kernel privileges. Um, so what happens there is that I've potentially given an access to the entire machine, and that violates that safety requirement that I have, right? If I try to run the guest OS with user privileges, that's generally OK, but I need to figure out what to do about these privilege instructions, right? So we'll t well, let's, let's talk a little bit about this, right? So what would I like to happen? My guest operating system is running inside the virtual machine, I'm, so so here's, here's, here's my trick, right? I have not given it kernel privilege, right? Spencer. The uh, guest OS uh, is, is different than the uh, instruction. Well, who, who is it going to be caught by first, right? So if I'm running in user privilege, the, the guest OS is running inside the virtual machine, it executes a privilege instruction, who catches it first? The host OS, right? And then who, but who needs to handle it? The virtual machine monitor, right? So ideally what happens is the CPU is going to trap, right? The trap is going to be uh, initially handled by the, by the what I, so this is what I want to happen, right? Sorry, I got ahead of myself, right? What I want to happen is I want the trap to be handled by the virtual machine monitor, right? Because this trap is going to change the state of the virtual machine, right? So. The virtual machine monitor is going to check and make sure the guest OS is doing something legitimate. So what's an illegitimate thing that it could try to do that we just discussed? What's a trap that I might need to, to kill the guest operating system for? Yeah. What's that? Well, not writing to the TLB. Writing what to the TLB? Nothing. What, what, what can it? So I, I want to allow it to write to the TLB, right? But what do I not want it to allow it to write to the TLB? Paul. <laughs> addresses. Addresses where? What, I mean, what memory should it not be able to see, right? This is the guest operating system, right? It should not be able to load a translation that points where? Post yeah, outside of the addresses uh, of the memory that's been allocated for the virtual machine, right? Um, so I need to make sure that it's doing something legitimate. If it is doing something legitimate, that remember, the virtual machine monitor is adjusting the state of this virtual machine, right? So if the trap that was generated by the guest OS is legitimate, I adjust the state of the virtual machine, 
right? And I continue, OK? So any instruction that has this property that can be handled this way is referred to as classically virtualizable, right? And it lends itself to this technique, right, where traps are, are vectored to the virtual machine monitor. The virtual machine monitor handles them, checks the trap, sees you know, if the guest OS is doing something legitimate, and then adjusts the state of the world. Right? And this approach is called trap and emulate. Right? So I trap the instruction. Right? I, I trap all privilege instructions, because I'm going to run the guest operating system without kernel privilege. Right? And those traps are passed to the virtual machine monitor. The virtual machine monitor essentially emulates the effect of the instruction on the virtual machine. Right? Um, all right, what time is it? Yeah, so, okay, so now, so now let's just look at one other corner case, right? So let's say, let's say that this happens, right? So, and, and the virtual machine, uh, the, the trap is handed to the virtual machine. What are the two things that I might need to do? What are two, so this is, again, mind melt. So what are, the two so what are the two things that can now cause a trap inside the virtual machine? Broadly speaking, right? Traps could be generated by what or what, right? That would, be need, to, that would need to be handled differently. Tim, what's one source of traps? Exception. Well, these are all exceptions, right? But the question is, who was running when the exception happened, right? So I'm um, No, no. So this is this is the these are things that are handled to the handed to the VMM, right? Traps that are generated by the virtual machine monitor will be handled by who? The host, right? But in, what is running? I mean, again, broadly speaking, what is one running inside the virtual machine? That that would create two different types of traps. Muta, what's one thing? The guest OS, right? So the guest OS is one source of traps. What's the other source of traps? applications, right? So this now causes a difference in handling inside the virtual machine monitor. If the trap is caused by an application, the trap actually needs to be handled by the guest operating system, right? So remember, on physical hardware, traps that are caused by applications are handled by the operating system. On virtual hardware, I have to do the same thing, right? The guest OS is going to handle the trap. The guest OS isn't going to know that the trap was first handled by the host operating system, then vectored to the virtual machine monitor, and then handed off to the guest OS, right? It's just going to run and handle the trap, right? However, if the trap was generated by the guest OS itself, remember, the guest OS is running without kernel privilege, so it's going to generate these traps, then that, those traps are handled directly by the virtual machine monitor itself, right? Because those traps affect the hardware, right? They affect the virtual machine that the virtual machine monitor is, is implemented, right? I know this stuff doesn't make sense the first time you, you see it. It didn't make sense to me at least the first 10 times I thought about it, right? But it, but it actually does, it does make a certain amount of sense. Um, all right. Let's stop here. And on Monday morning, we will resume and we'll finish talking about, about the, layered, the layered nature of traps on virtual machines. <laughs>